Welcome back again. This is week six. Today I'm going to talk about Plato, the Republic, and the youth of Rome. Remember that the, uh, the texts are online when you are uh, what, I, what you're looking at here is my syllabus. When you look at the syllabus, there are hyperlinks, so you can click there, and this will take you uh, will take you to uh, to the text. Well, it's going to take a second now. It's going to take you to the text, and uh, as well, Plato, the Euthyphro. When you click the hyperlink, is going to take you to uh, PowerPoint presentation. wanted to uh, okay well it's it's going to take a uh, too long so let's move on let's uh, let's do the lecture okay I'm going to start with uh, with Plato the Republic uh, I assign I didn't assign the whole book of the Republic but by the way remember that you have to read uh, certain pages I think it's uh, page 1 to uh, 45 um, Plato the Republic is a very interesting book, at least for me. You say that, Professor, because you're a, you're a philosopher. No, it's a very interesting book uh, because it talks about many, many interesting topics. It talks about justice, it talks about education, but we're going to focus on what, what it says about justice. Now, I want to remind you that when, um, when the, uh, the ancients talked about justice, and especially in the, in the Republic of Plato. The term justice is meant as more than justice, justice legal justice. Uh, it's meant as morality, right, wrong. What is the right thing to do? So it's a very rich term that, that, in, that includes a good life, how to live, uh, how to behave in a society. So let me talk about the, the uh, a, a few um, introductory uh, um, points about Plato. Plato was born in 427, uh, more or less, we think, 427. That is that will be uh, the year 427 BCE, which means before Common Era, uh, or in other words, it means that. It's 427 years before the year zero, when, when Jesus was born. And, um, and he died in 348 BCE. This is the, the, the ancient period, remember that. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, just as a, as a note, as you, uh, as you note, the, the years, it, um, in the before Common Era, um, dec the number of years decreases instead of increasing because they uh, they decrease and they they approach the year zero, and after the year zero, we we call we are right now in the uh, after the year zero, uh, and that the, all this period after the year zero we call it CE or common era okay but enough of that now plato um the name plato is curious because plato probably was a, a nickname uh, which means the broad plato was the son of a wealthy athenian family he um, had a future in uh, in politics he was supposed to be a politician he was a, a man uh, of honor. He served uh, uh, in the army during, uh, and he fought during uh, the Peloponnesian War. And of course, he was one of the most brilliant uh, human beings ever existed. That's why we're still studying his philosophy today. Now, Plato was uh, the student, the best student and best friend of Socrates. I think everybody knows Socrates, even if you never uh, took philosophy, you didn't go to college. The name of Socrates is so important uh, because he was probably 
in my view, he was the most intelligent and the most wise, the wisest person uh, ever who have ever lived in the history of the world. Um, so uh, Plato um, collected uh, uh, the ideas of Socrates. The problem is that we don't know which ideas are Socrates and which ideas are Plato's. Uh, because Socrates, unfortunately, <clears throat> never uh, wrote anything, never wrote a sentence in his life. Plato, on the other hand, wrote many, many uh, books, uh, and typically these books were written in the form of a dialogue, where it's like reading a play, where there are characters, and these characters say certain things, Plato preferred that format for, for some reason. Um, now, if you um, if you learn about Plato and Socrates, you know that in 399 BCE, something really um, bad happened that shook the uh, the West. Socrates was prosecuted and executed. He was charged of corrupting uh, young Athenians and, uh, and not believing in the gods of the state. Um, so Plato, uh, th this, this uh, tragic event led to, uh, to the deci the Plato's decision to, uh, uh, first of all, not become a politician. And he was so disgusted because the, uh, the Athenian government executed the, uh, the wisest man on earth, Socrates. So as a result, Plato left Athens and traveled, traveled widely. He uh, went to Italy, um, went to Sicily. Well, he, he traveled a lot. He returned Athens in 387, uh, where, where when uh, he decided to establish a school. This this is the prototype of a university, the academy. And and uh, this is the uh, the school where uh, where Aristotle studied as a student. So the academy continued until it was closed down finally in 500 and. 29 uh, of common era, 900 years. So uh, let's talk about the Republic. In the Republic, as I said, one of the main topics is morality. But as I said, if you read the, the entire uh, work, you, uh, you will find many, many different things. Metaphysics, morality, justice, education, and many other topics. But the main topic is a discussion of justice. As I said, justice, I think, should be, uh, should be viewed uh, in, in the sense of uh, not only legal justice, um, not only what is just for me to do, but, but also morality. What is the right thing to do? The good life. What is a good life? How do we live a good life? And moreover, and especially <clears throat> justice in a, in a sense of civic justice. What is the, uh, the best organization, political organization, uh, and the best way to, uh, to live uh, a um, good life in a good, just society? Now, in the... In the uh, these uh, few pages that I assigned, book um, which are essentially book one and book two, or if you want to call it chapter one and chapter two of the Republic, uh, the, uh, there are various characters who are engaged in a conversation with Socrates about justice. And uh, the conversation is very interesting because these individuals, <clears throat> which I'm going to name uh, very uh, very soon, 
all these individuals think that they know what justice is. And they try to, to define justice, but unfortunately, they are discussing with Socrates, and Socrates shows them that they are um, off the mark by justice. The first uh, character is a, uh, um, a retired uh, uh, merchant with the name of Cephas. By the way, this conversation happens in the house of Cephalus. Um, there, there's a religious uh, uh, festival going on, and so Socrates visits Cephalus' house, and there he finds many other guys. Um, <clears throat> Polymarchus also is there, who is the son of Cephalus. And, and then uh, we learn that there's a, <clears throat> there are the, the two brothers of, of Plato, Glaucon and Adamantus. But let's talk about Cephalus first. Socrates begins a conversation with Cephalus, and, uh, and soon uh, they, uh, they talk about justice. What do you think justice is? Cephalus responds that justice is nothing but paying your debts in society paying your debts um, to the gods, always tell the truth, and that is justice. If you live that way, you live a just life. But Socrates points out that <clears throat> it seems that it's not always a good idea to, uh, to pay your debts or to uh, return, because that's what a debt is, pay your debt. It's to uh, give back something. If, if, if you borrow my CD, uh, who, listen, who, who listens to CDs anymore? But anyway, if you borrow something from me or my book, you have to pay it back. You have to give it back. Is that justice? Socrates points out, that's not always just. Imagine that you, uh, you borrow a friend of yours borrows a weapon from, from you. Now this friend, for some reason, goes through uh, a crisis in his life, and uh, he has a, a depression, and this depression leads him, or her, to uh, being suicidal or homicidal. Now, would it be just to return the, uh, the weapon that you borrow from this person, this friend. Socrates says, I don't think so. And, um, well, Cephalus do doesn't say much. He uh, accepts that argument and, and off he goes. Polymarchus, the son of Cephalus, thinks that he can uh, restore his father's uh, uh, definition of justice by saying that what it has to be interpreted as doing pe uh, giving people what they deserve. So in that sense, we have to think about justice as paying your debts. Give people what they deserve. And what do they deserve, Polymarchus? According to Polymarchus, friends deserve to be helped, deserve good. Whereas enemies deserve harm, to be harmed. But Socrates has a, finds problems with this definition of justice. For one thing, think about it. Do we not make something worse if we harm it? So essentially, according to Polymarchus, justice would lead just men to make other men unjust by harming them, by making them worse. And certainly that's not something that justice is supposed to do. If we are to believe that justice is a virtue, it's something good that makes people happy and makes uh, things function well, then it seems to be something wrong about saying that justice, a virtue, the virtue of justice, 
it's something that that tells just men to uh, to make other men unjust. At this point, Thrasymachus, another character, protests and says, "Look, Socrates, you uh, you criticize our our um, definition definitions of justice. Why don't you give us a definition of justice?" Socrates I, says, "I don't know what justice is. I only um, see it." that your arguments are not valid. Okay, well then I'm going to give you my definition of justice. And get ready because you have to pay me for that. He says, sure, sure, I'll pay you. What is justice? Justice is what's advantageous to the stronger. And injustice is more profitable than justice. Um, if you practice injustice, you're going to be happy in life. But of course you have to do it well. I'm not talking about stealing uh, candies in a deli. I'm talking about big time organized injustice. Or uh, an injustice so clever, so crafty, that no one will, will ever know that you're doing injustice. So uh, Socrates says, well, but it seems that injustice destroys people's ability to work um, toward a common enterprise. Think about even, uh, even the mafia or uh, a, any criminal organization. How can they, uh, they work uh, together well and succeed if they are unjust, if they practice injustice, right? doesn't work that way. Um, besides, what do, you, uh, what do you have in mind when you say that justice isn't advantageous to, to the stronger? Well, what, what Thrasymachus has in mind is something very clever. He says, you understand that in life, in a society, there is a stronger party, which is the uh, ruler, the, the, the king or the democracy, the politicians, and uh, and on the other side, there are the weaker party, which, which is the people, people like us. Now, justice is advantageous to the stronger in a sense, in this sense, that the weak people like us, the weak, practice justice. In other words, we, weak people of, of the... Uh, of a, a, any society, pay bills, pay taxes, stand in line, say thank you and please. We do uh, the right thing. We call it the right thing. You know, when people uh, go to vote, they uh, they walk out with the uh, with the button "I voted" or the sticker "I voted," and uh, and they feel proud because they. Uh, they did their civic duty. Well, according to Thrasymachus, that person is a sucker. Yes. That person is just deluded. Because he did something just, sure. But by doing something just, he's doing something that uh, creates an advantage for the politicians, for the rulers. So in other words, by voting, by paying bills, by paying taxes, by following and obeying the laws, all we're doing as citizens, we're not doing anything, we're not doing ourselves a favor. We're not um, benefiting ourselves, but rather we are benefiting the rulers, the strong, the powerful. And I, and I hope you, you can see how uh, Thrasymachus' argument has a certain ring of truth to it. Because that's what we, we think, right, in society. That when we do things like that, when we are just, we do nothing else but 
uh, do a favor to uh, to derivatives. Okay. Now, so Thrasymachus then presents an analogy that ruling, being a politician, is an art. He calls it, in some of the translations, uh, they, they translate it as craft or art, doing an art. So in other words, Thrasymachus says, in the strict sense, a politician never makes mistakes. Okay, It's not permitted. If you make a mistake, you're not a true politician in a strict sense of the word. Just like a, a doctor. If a doctor makes a mistake, according to Thrasymachus, he or she is not a doctor. For example, if a doctor, doctor is supposed to cure patients. Suppose that a doctor um, often harm his patients by making mistakes. According to Thrasymachus, that is not a doctor. We cannot call him a doctor because the art of medicine is to cure people. Now, by saying this, Thrasymachus does not realize that he undermines his own argument because now Socrates is going to attack him and, uh, and say, if in the strict sense, the art of um, the art of ruling is an art and you never make mistakes like medicine is the art of curing patients then think about this being a doctor is for the uh, the benefit of whom certainly not the stronger. When you practice medicine as a doctor, you are do it to benefit the, uh, the weaker, the sick, the ill. So if you, Thrasymachus, wants to you want to use the analogy of art, if you want to say that ruling is like medicine, is like any other art, then you have to accept that the uh, the purpose of arts or crafts like medicine like ruling is for the benefit of the people and as a matter of fact Socrates says why do you think people want to become politicians the very reason why they want to become politicians is not for themselves not to benefit their, their own um, their own kind but to benefit the people uh, do you have evidence of this? Well, there is a there is a funny argument that Socrates uses, and it's the following. Think about this. If I ask, who wants ice cream? Everybody wants ice cream. By the way, this is not the uh, the argument of Socrates. I'm, I'm just uh, trying to explain what Socrates means. But what I mean is is the following. If if I ask who wants free ice cream, everybody wants it, right? But if I ask who wants to be a politician, now you're not going to say the uh, the same reaction. People are going to ask, "What's in it for me?" And that is the argument that to become a politician, you don't want to do it for free. And there is a reason, there's an explanation. Why not for free? Because you are doing work that benefits the weaker, the people. So in other words, according to Socrates, justice must be for the benefit of people. And the art of ruling must be for the benefit of the people. All arts are for the benefit of the people. All crafts. So, um, so Socrates seems to give justice a victory, although he has not defined justice yet. He merely has rejected all the arguments given, well, not all, at least at this point, uh, for justice. This prompts 
Glaucon and Adamantus to, uh, to offer yet another very clever and very powerful idea of justice. Justice, Glaucon argues, is not desirable for its own sake. It is the reputation that is desirable. Here's what I mean. Take two individuals, individual A and individual B. Now, individual A is a perfectly just individual. He always tells the truth. He always kind. He always stands in line, pays taxes, never deviates from, uh, from his duty. Okay? And then there's person B. Person B is as unjust as you can think. He is a rascal. He is uh, a liar. He is evil. He is nasty. And so on. Now, imagine further that individual A, the just one, the one who practiced justice, uh, for some reason, his life turned out to be a very bad life. He doesn't prosper in life. He suffers. As a matter of fact, he is viewed, considered by other people as a bad person, although he is a just person. So as a result of that, as I said, he suffers. Imagine even that as a result of his reputation, he goes to jail. Unjustly, of course, but he's in jail and he's suffering. It's not hard, by the way, to, to think of such a scenario. Now, on the other hand, think about the, uh, the other individual, individual B. Now, individual B, uh, fortunately for him or her, his life goes very, very well. And guess what? Nobody knows that he is a rascal, that he's dishonest, that he is an unjust person. So he practices injustice. He does everything uh, wrong. And yet, he has a good reputation. As a result of his reputation, his life is good. He prospers. He, uh, he's loved by everybody. He uh, becomes rich and famous, a benefactor. Imagine that he, um, uh, he does whatever he wants but he gets away with it because people don't know. He's very clever. He has a good reputation and people think he is a just person. Now, first of all, according to Glaucon, which of the two individuals, if you had to choose, would you choose? Individual A, who is perfectly just, but he suffers greatly in life. I just said that he's in jail, but imagine other bad, bad things that happen to him. Um, he uh, loses his family, his children, you name it. His life is really marred, he's ruined. Who, would, who in, his, in their right minds would ever choose to be individual A if they, they had to choose? Now, of course, you can say, well, I, I, I choose to be A, but with a good life. No, you have to choose between A and B. There's no other options. Which one would you choose? Well, according to Glaucon, everyone who is sane, everyone who is sensible, would choose individual B, the unjust individual who has a good life, because everybody wants to be happy. Now, the second point, important point of Glaucon is this, that if individual B 
lives a good life. What's the explanation? Why does he live a good life? Certainly it is, it is not because he is practicing injustice. And you can think about it. Even if he practiced justice, that would not lead necessarily to a good life. It's something else that leads individual B to a good life. Namely, it is his reputation. So, according to uh, Glaucon, justice is not valuable at all. It's not good in itself, but only uh, uh, a pain in the neck. It is something that you don't desire, you want to avoid as much as possible in life. In fact, if you can, and if you can get away with it, you should be an unjust person because that's going to lead to, uh, to uh, happiness. Why? Because there's something valuable about that, and it's the reputation. So uh, the reputation of being just rather than justice itself is what makes a life good. It's neither injustice or justice. It is how you, you, are, um, you are perceived by individuals. That's what's, what's the, the, the most profitable way of living. Now, of course, in the Republic, they don't talk about this, but I wonder what Glaucon would have responded if I, if I told him that, um, that then one should strive to, uh, to be a just person and at the same time um, attain a good reputation for being just. But that's not something that they discuss. So, um, the next argument that Glaucon gives is a very famous argument, and, uh, and it's not only an argument that serves the, the argument of the Republic of Glaucon. But it's an argument that applies to morality in general. And that's why I assigned these pages of the Republic, because it questions morality in a very, very deep and important way. Glaucon tells a story, a myth, the myth of Gyges. The story goes like, like this. One day, Gyges, who uh, was a, uh, a shepherd, found a magical ring. This ring has the power to, to make the person who wears it invisible. Now, once Gla um, Gyges realizes powers of the ring. He uses the ring to do, uh, well, to do what is convenient to him, which is to uh, seduce the queen and kill the, the king, and then marry the queen and rule happily ever after. Now, the point is the following. If you had that ring, why would you not use it? What would prevent you from using the ring? Think about this question. It's a very important question. Uh, so the, uh, the, the idea of the ring is like, I have my own example. Let me tell you my own example. When I was a child, I remember I fantasized about having a remote control that can freeze time. So I could go into a store get all the toys that I wanted, and, and then I'm on freeze time, and everybody's happy because nobody will ever know unless I tell them that I stole the, the toys, and I'm not stupid, I'm not going to tell them that. And, um, and everybody's happy. Now, why not? If you had a remote control, would you not use it? Or a magical ring? If I, had, if I had a remote control, what would prevent you? 
if you had a real deal? What would prevent you from freezing time, walking into a bank, and taking out some money? Then unfreeze time and everybody's happy. The bank is not going to close down. They're, they're, they have enough money to survive. And you are going to be able to pay your bills. And in fact, you, uh, you don't need to go to work. You can just freeze time and take money every time you need. Now, it doesn't mean that, that you have to uh, do bad things. For example, you can do good things. You can use the money to, uh, to benefit others, to donate the money, and, and live that kind of life. Still, you're doing something um, supposedly wrong because you're stealing money from a bank. But the point of the, uh, the star experiment is if you have power, if you are powerful enough to get away with anything, why would you not use it? Why would you not use that power? What would prevent you from doing that? And that's a very, very powerful question that questions morality in a sense that it seems that justice morality, according to Glaucon, according to Glaucon's argument, we are just not because it is good to be just, but we are just because it is convenient to us, because we fear punishment. That's why we don't go into a bank and take money out, because we fear punishment. That's why we say thank you and please, because, well, if we do that, other people will say thank you and please to us. But if we had the power to do whatever we wanted, we would not be just. We would certainly not be just. So even if just a man had this ring, he would use it. Even if you are, are the, uh, the most just person in the world, you would use the ring. You would use uh, the, uh, the remote control, according to Glaucon. Um, otherwise, according to Glaucon, you would be an idiot for not doing it. Okay. Next, let's talk about the Euthyphro. The Euthyphro is yet another dialogue by Plato. The Euthyphro was written uh, probably it, during the year 399 or 395 BCE. The main uh, character in this dialogue are only two, Socrates and Euthyphro. The dialogue is about another term, another rich term, piety. Have you ever heard uh, that person is a pious person? Well, piety means that you, uh, you are a good uh, religious person a pious person, that you obey God, uh, you respect uh, God, uh, and religious morality and the laws. Now, what happens in the dialogue? What happens is that Euthyphro, who is a rich person, has a, um, uh, a property, uh, and he has servants and slaves, and one of his slaves kills another one. Euthyphro is not around, his father is around, and so uh, he decides to, uh, uh, to tie up the, uh, uh, the perpetrator, the, uh, the servant who killed the other servant, and, um, and leave him there while he uh, finds help. And, um, and in the meantime, this servant, this slave, dies in the story, it says that he dies from being exposed to, uh, uh, to uh, the conditions. Maybe, who knows? We don't know exactly why. Maybe he died of thirst, uh, of hunger, who knows? But he dies. As a result, Euthyphro decides to, uh, to take his father, his own father, to court. Because, 
according to Euthyphro, his father has done something impious, something wrong. Now, how does he know, Euthyphro, that this is wrong? That is the, uh, the, the, the subject of this conversation, because Socrates uh, doesn't believe that Euthyphro knows that he is doing the right thing in prosecuting his father, and his father did the wrong thing in whatever, leaving that, um, that man to die. So, um, Euthyphro um, defines, defines piety, which, once again, in, in, uh, in this case, we have to think of piety as morality, doing right, doing your duty. So, um, according to Euthyphro, doing your duty, doing right, the right thing, the moral thing to do, is essentially doing what pleases the gods, somehow. And Euthyphro gives certain definitions of justice. He tries and he fails. His first definition is that pious, the pious is to do what I do. In other words, if your father or your mother or your sister does something wrong, you have to take him to court and prosecute them, no matter what. Socrates has to say that this is not a, a definition of piety because um, you, uh, you want a, uh, not just an example of piety, prosecuting your sister when she's wrong, but you want a general definition of justice, uh, I'm sorry, piety. That leads Euthyphro to uh, amend his definition and, uh, and define piety as follows. The pious is what is dear to the gods. Anything that is dear to the gods. Well, the gods say, oh, this is dear to me. Okay, that is the pious. And of course, this implies that, um, that according to Euthyphro, what Euthyphro did is dear to the gods. And what his father did is not dear to the gods. Now, Socrates points out that there are many things that are dear to the gods. So how do we know that what is dear to the gods? And how do we know that uh, prosecuting your father is something dear to the gods? Because the gods in ancient Greece uh, were believed to, uh, uh, to be many and to have many different opinions. After all, even Socrates asks Euthyphro, since he claims to be an expert. Euthyphro, isn't it true that gods, the gods often uh, fight and argue over things? Yes, that is true, Thrasymachus says. But then if they fight and argue, what do they fight about? Don't, don't tell me that they fight over uh, math or geometry, for example, where uh, we, everybody knows that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And even if you disagree with me, we can take a calculator and, and, and do the math, and voila, the, uh, the disagreement disappears. No, 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 that's not, that's not it. So what do you think it is, then? Why do you think the gods argue over things and disagree over many things? It must be that they argue and disagree over the same things that we human beings argue and disagree over. For example, the nature of justice, the nature of piety, the nature of art, of beauty. So what makes you think that what are you doing is dear to the gods? Well, just because I know it. Well, but that's not an answer. You have to tell me. You have to give me some sort of argument. Maybe what are you trying to say, Euthyphro, is that if something that you do or you say is viewed by the gods as dear, then that is, that is pious. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, Socrates. Oh, so uh, 
So basically, what you're saying is this, that something is pious if and only if all the gods, not just a few, not just a five or ten or one, but all the gods love something. For example, you, you say um, murder is wrong. And according to, uh, to Thrasymachus, then all the gods would be in love with that statement. All the gods would say, yes, we love it. Okay, Euthyphro accepts this definition. However, this definition uh, leads to uh, a uh, big problem, big, big problem. Because now Thrasymachus has to explain what is the pious. So there are two possibilities, essentially, according to this, this definition of piety. Or in other words, let me uh, rephrase it again. According to Thrasymachus, the pious is what is loved by all the gods, all of them. And the big problem is the following. How do the, the gods come to love something? Or uh, more, uh, more precisely, this doesn't explain what the pious is because the pious could be either of these two things. Either the pious is loved by all the gods because it is pious, or something is pious because it is loved by all the gods. Now, if you don't get the, uh, the difference between A and B, let me illustrate what I mean. Option A says that something is loved by the gods because it is pious. In other words, imagine uh, that that light, which is labeled pious, is the pious. Why is it pious? We don't know, but it is pious. That could be a statement, a person, an act, anything. Why is it pious? We don't know. It's already pious. So the answer to the question, why do all the gods love that thing, would be simply to say that they all love that thing for only one reason. And the reason is because that thing is pious. It's like saying, uh, why do you like money? Well, because it's money. Okay. But there's another option. There's another option. And the option is... Now you notice that the light is not labeled. There's no label. So the light could be anything. It could be a light, it could be a, an object, it could be a person, or a, an act, or a statement. Now the question is, why do all the gods love that thing? Certainly not because it is pious. So there must be another reason why they love that thing. Right? What could be the reason? Well, let's think about it. Perhaps they love some characteristics of that, that thing. But if they love, they, they all love that thing due to uh, a certain characteristic, then we, we're going back, after all, to, uh, to option A where all the gods love something because it is pious or because it has a characteristic. On the other hand, there is another possibility that they all love something and all of them love it just by pure coincidence, by pure accident. If you ask all the gods one by one, why do you love X? I don't know why. I just uh, love it. 
and um, and you ask all the other gods, and they say the same thing. Oh, I don't know. Just uh, just happen to love it. No no particular reason. Just love it. But then in this case, piety would be uh, something based on uh, on the uh, just the arbitrary preference of the gods. And you could say, well, yes, of course. But the problem now is that if the gods all love this thing that we call X for no reason whatsoever, it is also true that they can change their minds. And so if they change their minds, the pious would be something different every time. So, in other words, let me uh, rephrase what, what, I, what I just said. You have two options. Either the pious is already a pious thing. We don't know why, but it's pious. And that's the reason why all the gods love it. But the gods don't have an option but to love it because it is pious. On the other hand, it is the gods that decide they all decide that something becomes pious as a result of their act of loving that thing. But unfortunately, if you choose this option, you end up with um, the idea that piety is different every time. It's never consistent, which spells trouble for, for uh, Thrasymachus because, sorry, not Thrasymachus, uh, for uh, uh, <clears throat> for Euthyphro, because if if the gods change their minds, they uh, they might regard your uh, your decision to prosecute your father as pious today, but tomorrow they might change their minds. So either they don't change their minds because what are you doing is pious, or they decide what is pious but they can change their minds. And you have to make a decision. Unfortunately, um, Euthyphro doesn't understand what's going on, doesn't follow the, uh, the conversation or the argument. But that's the problem with piety. Either you, uh, you can say that it depends on the, on the gods, or it doesn't. If, the, if it depends on the god, on the gods, then it must be random, it must be arbitrary, and it can change. And if not, it doesn't depend on the gods, well, it doesn't depend on the gods, it is objective, and, uh, and then why are we even talking about the gods? If something is pious intrinsically, without any uh, reference to the gods, then we don't need the gods. But we still don't know what piety is. So uh, the conversation then um, goes in circle, where uh, it ends with uh, Euthyphro giving up and saying, I'm sorry, I don't have time now, I have to go, it's late. And Socrates is disappointed because he has not learned what piety is. Now this dialogue is very uh, uh, neat, and, it, and it's uh, known for... Uh, um, what is known as the Euthyphro uh, paradox or the Euthyphro dilemma. The Euthyphro dilemma is precisely the idea that morality cannot be uh, based on, on the gods or God. In other words, morality cannot have divine origin because if it does, then it would be completely arbitrary. So morality must be uh, independent of what God or gods think. All right, this ends our lecture. Once again, I hope you enjoy this lecture. You will find the video in the, in the, in a folder, and also you you will find once again these uh, PowerPoint presentations in my website, 123philosophy.wordpress.com.
uh, study them, read them, and enjoy them. I'll see you next time.